Try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right, much better. All right. Well, not really much better, but I just, you know, I don't want to keep wrestling with you guys. Your third service, and you sound like you're the least awake. That's just. Revelation chapter 16. Actually, Revelation chapter 15, not 16. Boy, I've been doing this all morning. Revelation 15. Now, um, as we turn there, a uh, couple of quick things that I want to bring up. Number one, uh, this prepper gathering that we're doing uh, is going to be great. The first one that we did was awesome. It was a full house. The place was crowded, um, and it was it was great. And what I really liked about the gathering was there was just this. It felt like a little swap meet in the in the church. Like I walked in, and at first I wanted to grab the whip and turn the tables and tell everybody, you know, you, no, but that's not what's going. It was it was like a trading post. It was pretty cool. So you guys uh, kind of uh, sharing things with one another and trading and kind of it was that was a really really good thing. Um, it's good to be ready, right? It's good to be prepared, and I th- there's no better place to learn how to be prepared than church because you're learning that spiritually and then the idea of bringing that into the uh sort of the the physical realm right because the physical realm is a reflection of what's happening in the spiritual so that's always a good thing and uh, we're excited about that now one other quick thing um before we get into well two things before we get into the study um the the next thing is if you are a member of the law enforcement fellowship um I am going to be sharing tomorrow night. So uh, if you are inclined to come join us, it'll be a lot of fun. And for those of you guys that don't like listening to uh, um, to Gil or Mason teaching, I'll be there tomorrow. So just come. No, I'm, I'm joking, actually. Um, they both do a fantastic job. Gil is, we, we need to congratulate him and pray for him. He is a father of a second baby now, which is awesome. And it's just a blessing. And uh, Mason has a couple of birthdays that he is celebrating for Junior and for um, uh, for Omar, which is a blessing. And that was already some previously arranged stuff. So I, you're stuck with me. You're stuck with me. So it'll be a lot of fun. And I'm actually very much looking forward to it. Um, we might even do some firearms training that, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm trying to, you guys are like not even alert. You know, I don't even get like, oh, not even one. I mean, what's going on? Um, okay. So, uh, there's that. And I, it, it's just going to be a great time. Now, the issue at hand that everybody wants to hear about is the subject of Israel. So let's, uh, spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, now I'm not going to get into the very, uh, this is going to be a super extreme bird's eye from space view. Uh, I will, this afternoon, I will record a, a relatively involved video. That video will probably be close to an hour in length. Uh, that will get into the nitty gritty of what's happening geopoli- uh, geopolitically and the implications of everything. But since we are third service, I can take a little bit more liberty. So I'm going to do that in um, explaining uh, what's going on. Uh, now, one thing that I want to just bring out right into the open is for those of you that don't know what happened, Iran launched a full scale attack against Israel uh, less than 24 hours ago. And for those of you that might not know the details with respect to that, uh, Iran put in the air somewhere in the neighborhood of a- anywhere from three to 500 of their drones and pointed their drones to all kinds of targets in Israel from the Knesset uh, to lots of targets in the capital city of Jerusalem uh, to all over Israel from the north to the south and accompanied uh, right around probably an hour into the attack. Uh, then they uh, launched their missiles and their missile technology is extensive. Uh, the missiles that they have are, uh, they're not like what we deal with when we start talking about Hamas and there'll be more on that to come. These are sophisticated missiles with pretty radical uh, homing uh, technology. And um, they all uh, heavily rely upon satellite technology. Um, the one thing that's very interesting about uh, Israel, which is really cool, is they're one of the only countries who have mastered uh, countrywide or nationwide jamming cell signals and jamming um, uh, uh, satellite signals. They're the only one of the only countries in the world that knows how to do that. And um, that actually saved the lives of hundreds, if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people uh, last night. Um, and more on that to come because it's really interesting. By the way, the reason why countries don't do this nationwide is because when they when they learn to jam those frequencies, they're also jamming the frequencies necessary to be able to provide defense for themselves. Israel has mastered 
um, how to isolate all that, which is something that's it's technology we've never seen anywhere, but Israel's doing it, which is really cool. Um, and it, it is uh, it is pretty, pretty cool stuff. Anyway, um, with all that said, this is what sort of was the cause of it. Uh, well, let me just simply say this. Uh, this was a, a, a factor that kind of was the, it, it's what Iran says is the cause of it. Okay, how about, how about we just put it that way? But the real cause is Iran hates uh, God. Iran hates Israel. Iran hates um, the Jews, right? They also hate the United States of America. They call the United States of America the big Satan and they call, Iran, uh, and they call Israel the little Satan, um, which uh, there's a lot to say about that and we'll, we'll just leave it at that. We're not gonna get into all the nitty and gritty of all of that, but I will tell you um, what they are saying is the cause of this was roughly 10 days ago, um, Israel launched an airstrike uh, against a very specific target in Damascus. Now, for those of you that don't know, Damascus is the city that houses Iran's uh, consulate building, okay? And right next to Iran's consulate building, actually attached to Iran's consulate building, is the building that everyone refers to as Al Quds building, okay? Now, for those of you that don't understand the Arabic language, when we say Al Quds in, in uh, Arabic, it means Jerusalem. That's, that's the other name for Jerusalem. So if you think about it, Al Quds building is the building that is designated for the destruction of Jerusalem, okay? Um, just so that you kind of have an, a, an understanding of what that's all about. Uh, the interesting thing about this building is at the time of the airstrike, the building housed seven of perhaps the most elite uh, commanders or high-ranking officials of the IRGC. Now, for those of you that uh, do not know, the IRGC represents the most elite of the soldiers uh, that uh, fight on behalf of Iran. This is Iran's military. And the other uh, fact that some may not know is when you talk about the largest military force in the Middle East right now, it's Iran's military, okay? They might not be the most capable, but they are undoubtedly the largest. That's a very important note uh, to bring up here. So when the airstrike took place, it not only destroyed or killed these seven high-ranking officials, the most high-ranking official was probably Iran's most valuable military asset because there was nobody that was ever as significant as a loss uh, since Soleimani was killed by the United States uh, several years ago while Trump was in office, okay? So keep in mind, Iran is still bitter over the United States of America over the death of Soleimani, and that's a whole other story that we just don't have the time to get into. So um, when that took place, uh, Khomeini swore on behalf of Iran that what was going to happen was they were going to uh, retaliate against Israel. Now, um, I went online and made many videos about this, and I was wrong about one prediction. My prediction was that Iran was going to do what they said they were going to do. And um, I was right in that sense where I was dead wrong was I made the general assumption that when Iran retaliated against Israel, that it would be through their proxies, okay? Because that is uh, namely how Iran actually functions. Now, Iran has lots of proxies in the region, okay? And some of you might be familiar with some of the proxies, others you might not be so familiar with the most um uh for what i would call the most uh, uh anomalous of the proxies the one that it just seems to be like a strange bedfellow uh, uh proxy is the most insignificant of them all and that is of course hamas now some of you might say hold on james first of all how is hamas the most insignificant of these uh terrorist organizations and number two how is it that they're a proxy of iran being that they are sunnis okay well it's really simple they are and as a matter of fact, what's interesting is all of the terrorists that did what they did on October the 7th uh, in uh, Hamas actually went to Iran to get the training necessary in order to do what they did when they did what they did on October 7th. We know that. That's a known fact. Iran actually admits it and is very proud of it, right? So um, it is kind of like a, uh, you know, uh, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. Uh, Hamas has acted as a, uh, uh, as a proxy of Iran for quite some time because of some things that Iran was promising them and 
giving them. So you have Hamas, which is a proxy of Iran. And I want to make this very clear. Hamas is the weakest of them all. If you were to look at all of the proxies of Iran and you were to talk about like, you know, uh, rank all of these uh, organizations, Hamas is the play school version. They're the kindergarten version. Heck, they're the preschool version of all the terrorists. And it's funny because you say, well, James, you know, they're, they're no joke. Look at what they did to all these Israelis. Look at how they changed the face of Israel. Look at everything that happened with the Jews and so on and so forth. Well, you're right. But you have to also keep this in mind. They're still not nearly as sophisticated or as powerful as the other terrorist organizations that are around. And that should be an eye-opening thing to all of us, right? Because when you look at Hamas, for example, think of it like this. When Hamas launches a rocket, it's a rocket, not a missile, okay? And their rockets are created by them digging into the ground where they're building tunnels, removing the water pipes that Israel put in there to keep them sustained and alive, cutting them up in pieces, and pretty much making uh, like mortar-type devices, right? Kind of like glorified Roman candles, okay? Um, They're still very dangerous because they can do a lot of damage, but they have no guidance capability. They don't have long-range capability, right? They might be able to extend a mile or two. They don't really do uh, the kind of damage that, for example, Hezbollah's missiles can do, right? Hezbollah does not have rockets. They actually have missiles, right? And any rockets they do have are shoulder-fired that have sophisticated guidance systems that are actually tied to it. So this is a very important notation to make. If, uh, if Hamas has, let's say right now, 30,000 rockets in their possession, Hezbollah, which in Arabic translates the party of Allah, Hezbollah has somewhere in the neighborhood of a quarter of a million to 300,000 missiles in their possession, okay? And well, let me say this about Hezbollah, which is the other proxy of Iran, and there are many other proxies, but I'm only gonna mention the, mention the ones that are pertinent to this actual story, okay? Hezbollah as a proxy of Iran is also the most powerful and well-organized terrorist organization in the world, okay? Let me at least say this, they're the most powerful and well-organized Middle Eastern terrorist organization in the world. They are very good at what they do, they know exactly what's going on around them, and they will absolutely not they will absolutely not present a minor type of an inconvenience whoever they attack. They will be a significant attack. And my belief was that uh, Hezbollah was going to be the proxy that was the most active, the most proxy, uh, the, the proxy of Iran that was going to be the most active. My general assumption was that they were going to attack from the north, um, which is, of course, the southern border of Lebanon. And the funny thing about Hezbollah is they are getting more markedly complicated as time goes on. For example, no Jews are living in the north right now. Very few Jews are living in the northern Israel, at least within that 10-mile range where the uh, border cities used to be because they are concerned about Hezbollah attacking in a very aggressive way that could pretty much uh, instantly end the lives of the Jews that are living in that part of of the woods. The other issue that Hezbollah, that they're facing with Hezbollah, of course, surrounds or centers around the idea that their movement is expanding because Hezbollah doesn't just exist in southern Lebanon. The reason why the first IRG strike or the, the, the strike on the IRGC officials took place, the airstrike by Israel, on uh, that building in Damascus was because that IRGC building that is in Damascus was designed to be there in Damascus because if you go further west, okay, you immediately go across the border into Beirut, okay? So the Lebanese have been trying to keep Hezbollah at bay when in reality, none of that has ever happened, hasn't happened in the last 10 or 15 years. And Hezbollah through its cooperation with Syria is actually entering into Lebanon now from that section in central in the central let's just call it the central eastern border of Lebanon in hopes to infiltrate this area of Beirut so that they can better position themselves to be available for attacks on Israel when they want to, for example, go into an area like, for example, the uh, Golan Heights. Because remember, when we talk about the Golan Heights, most people think that the Golan Heights refers to just Israel. But remember, there is a Golan Heights section of Syria that also exists, right? So the Golan Heights extends into the Syrian border and is right there. And so the biggest concern right now that many people who are 
posted in the IDF there um, uh, near the Golan Heights is concerned about the Syrian side of the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights, I said Golan Heights. The Golan Heights, which of course is a very important area for Israel to be securing because they are in direct danger. And folks, there is a lot of danger that they are facing over there, right? So my general assumption is that those proxies would function against Israel and not Iran. The other thing that we should note as well is that there's another notable proxy of Iran to discuss. There's, by the way, many of them. I'm only going over the three that are the most relevant to this conversation. I may go over all of them uh, in the recording that I make this afternoon that gets released tomorrow. But the other one that is very relevant to this discussion are the Houthis in Yemen, okay? The Yemeni Houthis, which of course, if you want to understand the geography of this, they are uh, dominantly located in the southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula. When we talk about the Arabian Peninsula, that is mostly occupied and held by Saudi Arabia. In the southern portion of the Arabian Peninsula, there are two significant countries that are there. One, of course, is Yemen. And in the southern portion, if you go further east, then you are looking at Oman, okay? Now, this is really important. Oman is more, sp uh, more specifically tied into the concerns that are going to relate to everything that is in, of course, the Persian Gulf. So when you start talking about the UAE, when you talk about Dubai, when you talk about Qatar, when you talk about uh, several portions of the western side, uh, for lack of a better term, or correct, the eastern side, for lack of a better term, of the Arabian Peninsula into the Persian Gulf, you have some bigger issues to be concerned with, okay? And of course, this is where um, uh, you are going to run into some significant variables that involve Iran on the other side of the Persian Gulf, which would you know, be the eastern side of the Persian Gulf. And then you're talking about the northern portion of the Persian Gulf, which actually touches areas like Kuwait and Iraq, okay? So, um, uh, but Oman is more significant to that area and concerns about security in the Indian Ocean. And of course, as you get closer into the Gulf of Aden, approaching the, the Red Sea, then that becomes a part of that discussion that we're not going to have. But the part of this discussion that is, is, is very important is the fact that the, um, see, notice how I had to catch a breath there, <laughs> that the uh, portion of the uh, Arabian Peninsula where Yemen is uh, provides a security, a major security concern with respect to the Yemeni Houthis. By the way, this is going to become an issue here in just a second, and I'll explain why. So my thought incorrectly was that we would see, con you know, a very concerted effort by the Yemeni Houthis, potentially some parts of Hezbollah, uh, in the north, and potentially maybe even Hamas as an attempt to distract Israel from their desire to go into the southern portion of Gaza, which there are still operations moving in that area, specifically Rafa, uh, very close to the Egyptian border, uh, northern Egypt, right? Uh, and then the southern portion of Gaza, uh, which, is, which is right there. It's the final frontier to destroy Hamas, which Israel is already gathering to do so. The general assumption was that many of the IDF was leaving, the Israeli Defense Force was leaving the area of northern Gaza in order order to be able to prepare for a, uh, a southern attack in that portion of Rafa, when in reality, what was really going on was Israel, I think, was actually preparing for the attack that they saw happen on Saturday. Now, with that said, Israel is not removing their, posi their position from the southern section of uh, Gaza because they can't risk the lives of all the people that are there and what could potentially happen because you could give a lot of strength and a, a, a lot of empowering to Hamas. They don't want to do that. But the bigger issue brings us to the area that I got wrong. And the area that I got wrong was I assumed that these proxies would act on behalf of Iran and that would be the retaliation that Iran had promised. Well, what we did not know or what we did not realize while there were a few little distracting skirmishes that were taking place and there were some rockets being fired from the north, the, specifically the southern border of Lebanon into the northern border of Israel, and there were a couple of other very distracting things happening, uh, Iran chose to release three to 500 drones, folks, three to 500 drones and pointed them towards Israel. Some, the capital city of Jerusalem. Uh, uh, matter of fact, they were even firing uh, or, or aiming at assets on the Temple Mount. There were all kinds of things that were going on that were happening there. And I was shocked because I would never have expected that. I would never have uh, expected Iran to do it. And then when they got the drones, uh, probably about an hour into their uh, destination, then they started launching their very sophisticated missiles. Now, the thing that, that, that you should know about the drones is they go low and slow, right? And they are very difficult to detect in some contexts. 
but the missiles are almost impossible to detect when they're on their way over because they go low, uh, lower, but way faster, right? And the, the, the speed uh, that these missiles have, especially with the guidance systems that they have, is unparalleled, right? You're not going to go fast. Uh, airplanes are not, I mean, you're talking about subsonic travel, okay? Uh, it, it's, it's very, 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 very quick. Um, and and uh, in some cases, you're at Mach 2 with some of these. I don't think Iran has any missiles that are faster than that, but they're, they're substantial. Like you're talking about super, super, super fast missiles. So they launch close to 100, if not they believe to be as many as 200 missiles all the way towards Israel. Now imagine being in Israel and knowing that all this is coming. Can you imagine, right? Okay, a little bit of a briefing. When October 7th happened, Israel chose to change, not change, but add to the defense capability of their Iron Dome system. And the defense capability of the Iron Dome system was now included to fight or deal with the problem of drones, okay? Thank God Israel did that, by the way. Because when this was attacked, this is one fact that you should know. This is sort of the post-mortem of all of this. So you understand what actually happened. Israel was able to defend themselves from 99.8% of everything going into the country. As a matter of fact, there was only one known casualty, and that was a Bedouin boy who took some shrapnel, and he was in the Negev, okay? Israel was able to thwart it all off, and it was, in essence, just a complete gone. It was Israel defended themselves beautifully. Now, a couple of things we should point out, because if you're a student of Bible prophecy, you need to understand some of these things. I'm going to go over those things in just a second. Two things worry me deeply about this. Okay? I'm very concerned for two groups of people. Very, very concerned. Number one, I'm concerned for the Iranians. Because I think they're about to go through a miserable life. And I think some terrible things are going to happen in Iran. And that really bothers me because I love the Iranian people. Uh, I think that if you meet anybody who's Persian, you're going to realize very quickly that they are some of the kindest some of the most welcoming, wonderful individuals you will uh, ever meet. They're just very, their whole culture is a very welcoming, kind, and loving culture. By the way, they've loved Israel all up until around 1979, right? 78, 79. And, and of course, you remember uh, what happened with that whole story. There's a lot, lot of uh, history to study there, okay? So I'm worried for Iran. But you know who I'm worried for more than Iran? I'm worried for the United States more than I am for Iran. And let me tell you why I'm worried more about the United States than I am Iran, okay? Joe Biden, upon successfully recognizing that Israel was able to effectively defend itself, contacted Netanyahu and told Netanyahu, if you attack Iran in retaliation, we will not support you. No joke. That is verified. That's exactly what he said. So think about the insanity of a statement like that, right? Good old Joe's handlers caused him to go out and say something this crazy. And what's really crazy about that is you wouldn't be surprised that he would do something like that because it was him and his regime that actually funded Iran with the money necessary to be able to do what they did to Israel, right? So those are two major concerns that I have. Now, with that aside, there are other concerns that I have that I could get into, but um, we don't have the time. Let me bring up three major concerns major, major things that came out of this. Like the kind of stuff that is like, it, 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 is, it is about as significant as uh, anything else related to Bible prophecy. These are three major things we have to look at, okay? The first of the major things, and this, this one is huge, right? The obvious, okay? Since the history of the existence or the reestablishment of the nation of Israel, Iran has never attacked Israel directly. They've always done it through their proxies, I've always ordered these attacks, but they have never attacked Israel directly. What is astounding about this one is that they did exactly that, okay? It is a major, major act of war. It is. So that's one major thing that we look at, and I want everybody to understand that that is going to dramatically change the geopolitics of the region, especially as it potentially relates to Ezekiel 38. Now, speaking of Ezekiel 38... We know for a fact that what we're watching right now is not Ezekiel 38 for a lot of reasons, and I can build that very clearly because at the time that Israel gets attacked by the whole coalition of nations, not just Iran, there will be like radical peace in Israel, right? And there's none of that going on right now. As a matter of fact, they're on all kinds of different war footings, and that's kind of a critical aspect to, to address. But 
Here's what gets really significant. Here's the second item to be looking at, okay? When the missiles started getting fired and the drones started getting released, almost immediately, almost immediately, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia acted on behalf of Israel and started defending Israel by shooting down those missiles and drones, right? Uh, by the way, that would not happen unless it comes at the order of the royal family, which is a major, major deal. And at the same time that's happening, there are missiles and drones that are coming from Syria, right? Because Iran has assets there. And almost immediately, Jordan actually starts firing away at those missiles and takes down many missiles and many drones, specifically acting in the interest of Israel. Okay? That's a big deal. That basically tells us it is not the same old Middle East that it used to be. We are dealing with a completely different Middle East right now. Now, here's the reason why it's a, such a big deal. Jordan is not mentioned in Ezekiel 38, right? We don't really see any significance with respect to Jordan. But what is significant or what becomes significant is Saudi Arabia is mentioned in Ezekiel 38. And Saudi Arabia is mentioned as a friend of Israel. Saudi Arabia actually objects verbally to what... Uh, Russia and the conglomerate of nations that join Russia are actually doing. They don't act militaristically speaking, which is why we know this is in Ezekiel 38, because we know Saudi Arabia has acted militaristically. Now, let me tell you the third one, and this is the one that is probably the most like, like the most like, wow, okay? The third item to be looking at, and this one is significant, okay? Russia issues a statement to, in essence, the whole world, but specifically targeted to Israel that says, if Iran is attacked or is retaliated against or is engaged, then Russia is not saying we won't support Israel. Russia is saying we will support Iran's efforts in defending themselves from the attack, okay? Now, let me tell you why that becomes very significant, right? Obviously, it becomes significant for the obvious issues that we're looking at with the geopolitical changes and all the other things that are going on. But in order to understand the real significance of this and why this is such a big deal, you have to go back to understanding what happened to Saudi Arabia when the United States of America did what it did when Joe Biden first became president. Joe Biden first becomes president and what does he do? He signs a declaration that basically states that the Yemeni Houthis are no longer considered by America, the United States of America, as being a terrorist organization. By the way, they just changed their mind on this just a few weeks ago, just so that you know, right? Uh, you fools, look at the damage you created when you did that. But the point is, is they declared the Yemeni Houthis as non-combatants. Now, why did Saudi Arabia get so mad by that declaration? Because Saudi Arabia has gone through extensive effort to defend their position in the South especially along the portion of the Red Sea from the Yemeni Houthis and their aggression and their aggressive behavior. But the problem is by the United States of America declaring the Yemeni Houthis as no longer being a combatant force, what they actually did, you ready for this? This is really critical. What they actually did was they tied the hands of Saudi Arabia. Why? Because an overwhelming amount of the military equipment that was being used by Saudi Arabia to defend their positions against the Yemeni Houthis belonged to the or sold by the United States of America to, uh, uh, to Saudi Arabia. Now there's a problem because there's an agreement when the United States of America sells its arms or military to any other nation and the agreement goes something like this. If you are buying arms from the United States of America, you are never allowed to use that military equipment against any nation or people group that the United States of America does not deem as being an enemy combatant. So Saudi Arabia lost its ability to defend itself with what Saudi Arabia do. Saudi Arabia tells America to get lost and they take a substantial amount of their money and they basically 20% of their, of their military defense budget and they go give it to Saudi or they go give it to Russia. And Russia gives them S-200 or S-300, S-400 batteries, gives them tanks and MiGs and all kinds of other things that they get. And the funny thing about this is, including helicopters, and the funny thing is, is it's very likely Russian S-300 and S-400 uh, missile batteries that launched the missiles that intercepted Iran's uh, drones and missiles coming in, for, uh, coming in for Israel. The problem now is that if Russia is taking the stand that they're taking with, uh, with Iran, you were definitely going to be met with significant resistance between Russia and Saudi Arabia, which is going to create a bigger security problem for Saudi Arabia than most people think because 
of the problem with uh, Russia's position in the Red Sea. And there is so much to talk about. We don't have the time to do it, but it, it, we basically, guys, let me just explain what's happening. We are staring at a fully functional powder keg that is ready to blow like the, like the kind of blowing we've never seen. It is going to be the type of explosion that we've never seen. And none of us should be surprised because the Bible told us to expect this kind of thing. Right. Um, and, uh, it's going to be interesting to see. So who do you keep your eye on during this time? You keep your eye on Saudi Arabia. You keep your eye on Russia, especially the positions that Russia holds, not only in the Mediterranean, but in the Red Sea, where they are in, uh, in uh, Somalia, where they are in Ethiopia, where they are in the Sudan, because they do have uh, things that are located on those. They have assets, assets located in that area, where they are in the southern and even northern portion of the Arabian Peninsula, where they are in Libya, and all the other areas that go in between, you need to pay attention to Russia. Not only do you need to pay attention to Russia, but you need to pay attention to Yemen. You need to pay attention, of course, to the obvious Iran, Iraq. We've got to pay attention to those folks, but also we need to be paying attention to North Korea, okay? Because there's an element there that is going to be the, um, the canary in the coal mine. How about we call it that? Korea, North Korea will be the canary in the coal mine for being able to understand other progressive movements that are going to take place in the region, right? So, um, it, matter, matter of fact, I'm watching the I'm watching North Korea more than I'm watching China because I'm going to be more concerned with movement I see in North Korea than I ever will in China because of what we know. Because of what I know is the value of North Korea as it relates to the movements of countries that are in that area in order to create the kind of condition that we know will be created when Ezekiel 38 comes. So. The bottom line here is this. We got to pray for Israel. Okay? We got to pray for Israel. It's a big deal right now what's going on over there. So when we pray to get into the Bible study here, and a Bible study, we're probably going to be about 25 minutes in, um, in this chapter. It's a short chapter. And there's a reason. I, the Lord knew, right? I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I made the decision. We're only going to go through chapter 15. I had no idea that war was going to break out. We were going to see this. But it is very useful information. And we will get into all of this a lot more extensively in the video that I release tomorrow. And hopefully it'll be, it'll be helpful when we just uh, provide some of the analysis that you're going to need to know regarding all of this stuff. So, okay, with that, Revelation chapter 15, let's pray. We'll pray for Israel together, and then we'll get into the passage. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for your word and everything that your word does for us, Lord, what it presents, Lord, the things that you have for us. And Lord, I just take a moment right now to pray, Lord, for our time in your word. I pray, God, that the words that I share would be your word, Lord, and not mine, and that, Father, you'd be glorified in and through everything, Lord, that's being communicated and said. And, Father, I just pray right now that you would align our hearts to yours, Lord, that we would understand and know and recognize and realize, Lord, that you are hard at work in our lives, Lord, and that you have a plan and a purpose, Lord, for not just us, but the whole world. And we pray, God, that we would hold fast to that and recognize it for what it is. And Lord, I just pray uh, right now in this very moment, Lord, um, that you would just protect your ancestrally chosen people, the Jews, Lord. We pray, God, that you would protect Jews all over the world. We pray, Lord, for the nation of Israel, that you would protect them, Lord. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we just pray, God, for your hand to be upon every aspect of what is going on right now uh, with your people, Lord. Protect them, Father. Have your hand upon them. Lord, we pray that you would frustrate the efforts of Iran. Lord, that you would destroy every last thing that they are seeking to do and wanting to destroy the nation of Israel, Lord. And we pray that you would remove that wicked leadership from, the, from that people, Lord, that that people would be able to experience something very special. Lord, we thank you for the fact that the largest growing section of the Christian church today is actually in Iran. And we thank you, Lord, for those believers. We pray that you would get a hold of uh, more believers in that area, Lord, that you would just touch their hearts, build them up, Lord, strengthen them, and be with, uh, with our uh, brothers and sisters that are in Iran right now. So, Father, we just look to you. We thank you. We pray that you would go before us, fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Revelation chapter 15, and I am going to start off this chapter by saying something that I say all the time, and that is this, you are never going to understand the book of Revelation really well unless you know the Old Testament, and there are so many aspects of the Old Testament that are relevant to certain portions of Re Revelation, actually all portions of Revelation, but there are certain areas that we emphasize over others depending on what text that you're going to be in, and one aspect of this goes 
goes to the way that the Old Testament is actually written and, of course, the language, literacy, and culture of the Old Testament, right? And this is very important to understand this because if you don't understand this, you are going to have a very significant time struggling with understanding the chronology of the book of Revelation. Why? Because Revelation was written in a way that is very akin to how we see the writing of the Old Testament with respect to its chronology, right? There's other uh, associations that you can very, very easily make with the writing style in Revelation with many of the things that you see in the Old Testament. But chronology is kind of a big deal. It's a discussion that's really, really important here. And let me explain why. That has nothing to do with the chronology right there. But, um, <laughs> but here's the thing, right? When you look at the writing of the Old Testament, the, the Jewish culture, the writing in the Old Testament is nothing like English literature, right? We are very different in the world of English literature than we will ever be in the world of Hebrew literature. As a matter of fact, let me just simply say this. An overwhelming part of the world that is represented by patriarchal cultures do not write the way we write in English, okay? It, it, we're very different, okay? Let me explain what I mean when I say this. When I write in English, I write with the chronology that dictates the contents of my writing, okay? So for example, let's say I were to write a book about the, um, the years that Ronald Reagan was in office, right? My book would start with 1980, right? And if I wanted to talk about the campaign and so on and so forth, I guess I could start as early as 1978 and talk about some of the, the intricacies with what happened with California and the Republican Party and so on and so forth. But I would start with 1980, okay? And the book would, the end of the book would be 1988. And nowhere in the middle of the book or the beginning of the book would you see any reference to anything that is 1981 or 1988. Everything is in order. It's 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, right? That would be the way it would be. And most English literature is this way. When it comes to uh, Hebrew literature, it is nothing like that. As a matter of fact, what should be understood with respect to Hebrew literature is when you see writing in the Old Testament, they start with a very, 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 very high, almost like a Goodyear blimp, uh, in some cases, the space shuttle view of the story. Okay, and so they give you a view of the story at the top and then what they do is they hone in on different parts of the story and they do not regard chronology as the variable that exists that determines how the story is being told. In other words, you might hear a story, a detail of the story that is at the end of the timeline and at the same time you might hear a detail of the story that's at the middle or at the beginning of the timeline. And the reason why is because perhaps in my opinion, one of the better ways of communicating is by doing it like that because when you're able to to teach somebody the overall picture and then go into aspects of the chronology that don't necessarily involve having to use a predicate value, right? In other words, you're not having to, to be limited by where it starts and where it ends and you just tell everything the way it is from a bird's eye view, then it really begins to, to make sense. By the way, I want to make one note that I haven't made in other, other services because we have the time to do this. The Bible tells us that we were created in the likeness and image of God, right? Right? If we were created in the likeness and image of God, you have to understand that the way that God looks at chronology is completely different than anything we do when we view chronology. Why? Because God lives outside of the realm of time. So God is watching this Bible study happening at the same time he's watching the order being issued by the Iraqi com or the Iranian commanders to fire off the missiles at the same time that he's watching the nation of Israel being reestablished, at the same time that he's watching King David fight the Philistines, at the same time that he's actually creating the heavens and the earth. When he's seeing it all, he's all watching it all happen at the same time because he lives outside of the realm of time. So if we as individuals who've been created in the likeness and image of God, who will never be God, but we're created in the likeness and image of God, wouldn't you think that the learning style that we take when we want to understand history would be better suited if we saw it outside of the standard chronology that we've brainwashed ourselves into looking at? Rather, wouldn't it be a lot more interesting to us if we looked at it from the type of uh, uh, tool that is used in the Hebrew Bible, I think it would make a big difference in the way we learn. By the way, I want to give you evidence of this, this fact, and it's really important. The most effective communicators in the world do exactly what I just described. As a matter of fact, when you need to communicate something that is super critical and you need to remove any type of doubt 
from what you're communicating, you will always use this option. You will always share the bird's eye view first, and then you will visit certain aspects of the chronology, not based on the timeline order, but rather based on the stipulation of certain facts in order to create a better understanding of the story as a whole. Can I give you a modern day example of where this is used and, and what it's talked about? Uh, criminal law. Shall we just talk about that for just a second? As a matter of fact, anybody who goes to law school, when you take criminal law, one of the if, if you've if you've if you've taken law school anytime after the year 2000 in your criminal law class it's very likely that your professor will spend a lot of time analyzing one very important court case a, a critical one in the story of criminal law or in the study of criminal law you know what that court case will be oj simpson trial right someone said it actually i don't know if there was a, maybe there's an attorney in the room that actually said it. it's the oj simpson trial okay um, why? Because the brilliance behind Johnny Cochran, and Johnny Cochran was the, was the brilliant one in being able to establish reasonable doubt from the perspective of a kind of almost a jingle, right? Because what do we all remember Johnny Cochran for saying? Anybody? That's right. You guys all got it. If it don't fit, y'all got to acquit, right? And he said a million different ways, but that is what established uh, this. Uh, he, he was made brilliant for that, right? And by the way, Johnny Cochran had a long and distinguished career of doing things like that, which is why he was one of the best of the best when it came to criminal defense attorneys, right? Um, but you, uh, Johnny Cochran uh, uh, gave us a lot of ground to understand this, and so did, of course, uh, uh, Cardassian and Sapiro. They, they they all taught us this, this principle. In the law, what a lot of defense attorneys will do when they're good, when they're worth a bean, is they'll go to the jury and they will tell the bird's eye view of what happened. And then in order to establish reasonable doubt, what they will do is they will poke holes in the chronology, not in the order that it happened, but they will poke holes in the chronology as it relates to the stipulation of facts provided in the evidentiary uh, hearings and procedures. So they take all the facts that they have in evidence and they will use those facts to create reasonable doubt. And the most effective way that they do that is to remove the jury from the understanding of the chronology of the timeline and show them a picture as a whole. Why? Because if you can see the picture as a whole, you will understand the matter a lot better. And if you understand the matter a lot better, if there's even a, 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 a thought in your mind that there could be reasonable doubt, then you have to defend that way. Otherwise, you're actually an incompetent attorney. You, you would not do a good job. And Johnny Cochran knew from the very beginning the way custom expensive gloves work. He knew for a fact that those gloves are very custom fitting. And he knew beyond the shadow of a doubt he knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that the only way that glove would fit OJ perfectly is if OJ put that glove on exactly how it was intended to be put on. But he made a very, very powerful argument to the judge. And of course, if you remember, Judge Ito agreed to this when the evidentiary portion uh, was discussed. He made a very powerful argument that says you break the chain of evidence, in essence, and the integrity of the evidence if you make my client put that glove on with his bare hands. He must, he must put on a specific type of latex glove that will shield his DNA from being put on that, on that piece. And it was very, it was a very important part of the, of the chain of custody discussion and the evidence discussion. And so what happens? He puts the, 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 the latex glove on his hand, knowing full well that the glove would not fit perfectly. So guess what? They put the glove on. It did not fit perfectly. The person, the prosecution was too um, ignorant, and I'm gonna say that they, they, they were too arrogant, right? And, and especially Darden, he really blew this, right? But they were too uh, foolish to recognize the opportunity that they had in getting that stricken from the evidence. But they, I mean, there was, there's so much to that. But the bottom line was, it was very effective, right? Because he puts the glove on, man, if it don't fit, you gotta acquit. Because by expanding the timeline or expanding the view of the timeline and going into specific areas of the chronology, they were able to poke holes in the order that the prosecution was actually uh, you know, relying on, which created doubt, reasonable doubt, more reasonable doubt than you can even imagine amongst the jury, which is why the jury acquitted OJ, right? Now, I suspect that OJ just recently went before a judge that is gonna give him the judge. Anyway, I'm gonna leave that, I'll just leave that, I'll just leave that be. But 
Nonetheless, this is the way that this, that this happens. And by the way, this is why the Bible does what it does in how it communicates stories to us without using the traditional timelines that we have. Can I give you an example of this in the Bible? Uh, here's a great example from the very beginning in the book of Genesis, right? The Bible tells us this. In the beginning, God created the, heaven, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And it goes on to talk about, you know, uh, darkness being over the face of the deep and all the other things that we learned. And then it goes over the biblical account of how God created the heavens and the earth. And it talks about what he did in six days and on the seventh day he rested. And then you get to chapter two of the book of Genesis. And in chapter two, what does it do? It tells us the story of God creating man in depth. It gets a little bit more in depth. Well, guess what? The chronology of the creation of all of the world was given to us in the telling of the bird's eye view, the story of what God did in those first six or that, in that first six days, actually the first seven days, if you include the day of rest, all given to us in chapter one. And now we're going in the middle of that story and we're learning that. And by the way, that happens all over the Bible. Okay, let me give you another example of this. We'll talk about me uh, teaching Isaiah in the Bible college. Now here's something that you would think uh, about like students. Students do this. They drop out when things get difficult or they realize they can't make the time obligation or they don't think they're going to do well. Of all of the classes that are in, um, uh, that are taught at the collegiate level, and this is actually very true of foreign languages in general, but especially in Bible college, the ones that are the most significant, that have the most significant dropout rates are always going to be, ready? Greek, Hebrew, right? Latin, probably a third, uh, kind of like a, in third place. And then when you get into languages like Aramaic and stuff, forget about it. Most people are not committed to even want to take a class. That's why a lot of Bible colleges won't even offer classes for something like that, right? So um, when we used to teach original language, we had a lot of people drop out of Hebrew and of Greek, but there was only one other class outside of Hebrew and Greek that most students dropped out, or a larger percentage of students dropped out of, and it was only, a, and, and by the way, this class wasn't when it was taught in general, this class had the largest dropout rate when I taught it, okay? What was that class? The book of Isaiah, all right? Why? Let me explain why. When we take the book of Isaiah, when we started, I said there was no textbook requirement other than Nelson's complete book of Bible maps and charts. And I did not make that a requirement, even though I said it will substantially help your understanding of what we're going through, which is why all my students got them. And if they didn't, they always got them within the second week, okay? So they'd get that. But here was the assignment. I gave it to them on day one. I said, this is a running assignment that you are required to do again and again and again. Every week, you must do this once. Okay, what's the assignment? People are thinking, you gotta journal this, you gotta write this down. That's what people are thinking. And by the way, when I gave this assignment, you could see people looking down very eagerly, getting ready to write on their notepad. And when I gave them the assignment, they did this. Just look at my face, right? They would write. <laughs> like, really? Did you really just say that? What was the assignment? The assignment was simple. Very, very simple. It was this. I need you to read almost all of the Old Testament every single week. Every single week roughly 37 of the 39 books that you see in the Old Testament. I may have been, I may have done it as little as 35 of the 39 books, but I need you, uh, actually at that time it was 34 of the 39 books in the Old Testament. I need you to read all of those books and I need you to be intimately acquainted with it, which is why you are required to read almost all of the Old Testament once a week. Okay. Now, the students that are brand new don't understand why. They think that's me telling them to go dig a ditch. Like you're just giving me busy work, that's ridiculous, right? And I told them, I said, this isn't the only homework you're getting, right? You're also gonna be getting other assignments. It's a 16 week class. Now, an overwhelming amount of people will drop out of this class. And we warned everybody. As a matter of fact, budgetary wise, um, the reason, only reason why we were, afford, we were able to afford doing this class was because at the time I was the dean of the Bible college and the Bible college wasn't compensating me individually for teaching the class like we compensated individual professors for doing their classes, right? So we were able to, to still carry the class even if there was, you know, eight people instead of 40, right? So um, everybody that went through that class and did exactly as I asked them to came to me and said, I will be eternally grateful for you requiring this of me. Why? Okay. That assignment was predicated upon the understanding that you will never be able to understand the book of Isaiah if you do not understand the bird's eye view that the Bible gives you of all of the chronology 
that exists in Israeli history, in Jewish history. So you need to understand the whole sphere of it before you're able to understand what appears to be Isaiah going all over the place with different times and different hours and different places and different seasons. If you know all of the Bible as a whole and you understand the history of the Northern and the Southern Kingdom and you know what's going on with the prophets and the law, you get all of this stuff under your belt, you are gonna have a very, very easy time going through Isaiah. What my students began to realize was an overwhelming majority of their study of Isaiah was founded in their study of learning the Old Testament. And when they got to Isaiah, it was like, it was like wearing an old glove. It just, it just was easy for them. It was like no big deal. They just skated through it. As a matter of fact, every single year I did this, I did this for three years. I told my students, your final exam will be nothing that I'm preparing you for other than you doing the work here in the class. And in your final exam, I'm going to give you an assignment that's going to be very, it's going to, if I told you what that, what that exam was, it's a three hour exam. If I told you what that exam was, you would not want to take the class. But when you, at the end of this class, when I give you the exam, you're going to be like, really, is it really that easy? As a matter of fact, they would typically get three hours to conduct their exam and they would normally get it done in an hour and a half, right? And the, and the exam was, in essence, uh, and I'm not going to get into the details in case I ever teach this again, but the exam, the nitty gritty of the exam is tell me everything that happened in the story of Isaiah, basically. And they can typically get it done for me in about an hour and a half in the most effective way, they'll just outline it for me. And boom, 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 boom. You know, and they come up to me, they say, Pastor James, you know, I didn't even have to look at my Bible. You, well, you, it was open Bible. You could have looked at your Bible. I didn't even have to look at it. I just knew it. I just recognized it. Why? Because they were able to understand the story of Isaiah much better because they understood the chronology of the Bible as a whole. They got the bird's eye view. Then they got into the specific details of the descriptions and they became more acclimated to the understanding. Many of you guys sit here and ask me, James, how do you identify this? Or how do you point this out? Or how do you come up with this? This is how. This is, this is one of the, 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 the most effective tools that I utilize, and that's being able to understand the literature the way it was given to us by God's ancestrally chosen people, right? The way it was given to us by the Jews. The way God tells the stories is the way we need to read the stories, because if we don't read the stories that way, then we have a problem. So when we get into Revelation chapter 15, we're dealing with the same exact thing. By the way, when I took the time to learn the book of Revelation to teach you guys, by the way, this, uh, the first time I did this was, you know, almost 30 years ago, but um, it was exactly using this method. It's read the book of Revelation again and 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 have it virtually memorized. Why? Because when I understand the bird's eye view and then I put it in light of the bird's eye view of the Old Testament, then understanding the chronology of the book is going to be really, really easy. And when we get into the beginning of Revelation uh, chapter 15, we are talking about an interlude, right? A lot of people will call it an interlude before the vile judgments or what people oftentimes refer to as the bold judgments. And the funny thing about these judgments is it would appear as though the same exact thing is happening, right? We're getting an overall bird's eye view of what's going to happen. And then we hone in on the stories, by the way, so much so that if you understand the Bible this way and you understand the book of Revelation this way, you'll also understand the fact that it is highly likely that the vile judgments, right? The bold judgments are happening at the same time or around the same time as the trumpet judgments, right? They're not happening in, in some weird chronological order. They're all happening together. And as a matter of fact, some of the seal judgments are actually happening at the same time that the bowl and the, um, the trumpet judgments are taking place. But you're not going to see that if you don't understand how the story is actually being told, right? And John is being guided through the story of the end times by the Lord in a way that the that he tells the story the way it was given to him and that was outside of a very specific chronology, right? It was, here's the overall picture. Let me hone in on this part of it. Here's the overall picture. Let me hone in on this part of it. Here's the overall picture. Let me hone in on this. And then once the overall picture has been given to you, we'll get to the the last chapter of the book of Revelation and it'll all make sense because you were given the foundation necessary to be able to see and understand clearly what's going on. And that is exactly what we're seeing as we dig into Revelation chapter 15 because when we get into Revelation chapter 15 we are back in heaven again, okay? And it's a very interesting picture. We're right back in heaven and it's very likely around the same time that we are actually seeing something happening in Revelation chapter 5, right? It's interesting to think about this but you'll understand this more when you learn it this way. So, whew, that was a mouthful, right? Yeah. Okay, this will go by pretty quickly. So let's read this because it's important. I Look, so, there are times when when you teach the Bible, 
you have to give people the education and the background before you actually read the text. And then when you read the text, it begins to just make all kinds of sense, right? It, it might, if, if, if all you do is listen to me read the text, then it's going to be confusing. But now that you have the background and the education, reading the text is going to be awesome, okay? So let's dig into it. It gets interesting, okay? Verse 1. Revelation chapter 15, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Okay, we learned a lot of things from this chapter, immediate, or from this verse immediately, right? First of all, we learned something very relevant to the issue that I've been talking about as of late. As of late, how many of you guys have been hearing all the stories about the eclipse and so on and so forth? Okay, let me just explain something about the eclipse that recently happened. Um, it is a notable and an absolutely spectacular event, okay? Let me take it a step further, all right? So much so that I am still very jealous over the fact that uh, there are people in this church that actually went out of state to uh, the path of totality to actually see the eclipse in its entirety. As a matter of fact, there's a very twisted and sadistic part of me that was happy that my brother was going to be stuck in town watching the eclipse the same way I do because he was originally planning on going with somebody from this church with his family to go watch the eclipse over there. And I'm like, well, if you don't get to watch it, if I don't get to watch it, you don't get to watch it. <laughs> you know, anyway, a little twisted. But the reality of it is it was a notable event. It was a spectacular event. And any family that could get their kids away along the path of totality to watch it, it's such a powerful educational opportunity. Why? Because chances are that kid that you took to watch that will probably never see that again in their lifetime, at least in the United States of America, they won't, right? It's kind of interesting when you think about that, when you, when you look at the significance of something like that. But here's the thing. People have taken it from that to this is a sign that the world is going to end. The craziness that I have heard people say about this thing. They talk about this X, uh, which uh, is created by the path of totality from the eclipse that happened in 2017 to the path of totality uh, that uh, the eclipse left or th that was associated with this eclipse in 2024. It makes this X and the intersection point is very important. And they, they go by the name of the city of the intersection point and they talk about the, the path that, that happened in 2017, which was the time that um, Trump was in office. Uh, all the, the names of the cities were names in indicative of blessing and the path of totality here goes over a bunch of uh, uh cities who's indicative of judgment Nineveh Nineveh there were like eight Ninevehs I and mean, it's like oh my goodness are we really doing this right and then the arguments over this x is the shape of a Hebrew letter and then all of a sudden it's like everybody and their mama has become Hebrew experts right Hebrew language experts and they're telling us the significance of this letter and and they're making all these cases and by the way People spending an insane amount of time producing remarkably convincing videos on YouTube, very high production value videos, okay? Take it from a guy who has three full-time editors working for him, full-time editors and one project manager to manage those editors. It's not easy work. Okay, and I'm doing some of the easiest stuff to edit. Like my work is some of the easiest work to be able to edit because I'm a talking head and people don't come to watch, you know, all kinds of this and that and here and there. People come to listen to what's actually being communicated, right? But it's not easy. And when somebody's, like, I, there were some of these videos I was just watching for fun. I'm like, oh yeah, that easily cost them $50,000 to produce. Oh, that easily cost them 20 grand. Oh, that was, e even for a YouTuber, that was a $100,000 video. I'm like, I, there were certain, very, many videos that were like that. I'm like, oh my goodness, they spent a ton of money. And by the way, they made their money back in ad revenue because they, those are the ones that got viewed by 8 million people or whatever it was, right? But you look at these things and you realize, man, it's just so convincing and and, but the problem is, is the reason why those videos are so intriguing and so convincing is because there's enough ambiguity in the events and enough of anomaly associated with the event that it gives room for people to make a whole bunch of assumptions that just aren't accurate, right? Here's the thing that blows out of the water all of the arguments that people are making about the eclipse and looking for signs in the sky and all that kind of stuff. When the Bible talks about God giving us signs in the sky, the Bible makes it clear, you'll know exactly what it is. There will not be a question. There won't, you won't have to do any detective work. You're not going to have to memorize a, a, a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. You're not going to have to study the names of cities. And it's, it's just going to be right there. Case in point. Let me read verse 15, the first part, the verse one uh, of chapter 15, the very first verse. 
And I saw another sign in the heaven. And all the other signs that he's been watching in the heavens, guys, have been very obvious what they are, right? He's seeing them. Great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues. He knows what they are. They're great and marvelous, and he knows what he's looking at. He's clear. There's no ambiguity as to what he's looking at, right? And here's the other, pack, uh, the other piece of information we get. It says this. Look at the last part of this. Having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So when he's looking at this, he realizes these judgments that are coming, these plagues that are coming in these vials, these bold judgments that people would call it, is the finality of God's judgment. In other words, this is the la- This is it. This is, this is the last of it, which means it's going to be the end. It's, it's kaputs, right? So when you look at the sky and you see an eclipse, don't say it's going to be the end. When you look at the sky and you see this happening, you can say it's going to be the end. You understand what I mean when I say that, right? Very important that we recognize this. Verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and it over his uh, image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. By the way, when we talk about the sea of glass uh, mingled with fire, we are talking about heaven. They're in heaven right now. And what he is seeing is he is seeing saints. When we talk about this, he's not looking at the church here. He is looking at saints, okay? He is looking at believers who believed in the time of the tribulation. They didn't believe before the rapture, but when the rapture happened, then they did believe. And the Bible says that they had victory over the beast. Now, when they say victory over the beast, does that mean they destroyed the beast and they eliminated him? No. Victory in that they didn't give in to the mark of the beast. They didn't give in to the worship of the beast. They didn't give in to the image of the beast. They didn't give in to any of that. They basically resisted and they died as a result of it, right? So they're in heaven and they're experiencing the reward and the benefit of that very thing taking place. Watch this, verse 3. And they sing a song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Right? This is uh, uh, an interesting uh, thing that ends up happening because what you're actually seeing is you're seeing two people groups that are singing two different songs. The first people group is, uh, my guess is the 144,000, right? They're in heaven and they are singing the song of Moses. The other people group are the people group that has just been mentioned, those saints that actually died in the midst of the tribulation uh, at the hands of the Antichrist, right? Because of their belief in Christ over the belief of Antichrist. And they are singing a song of the Lamb. Now, we know what these songs are because we have records of both of these songs, right? The first, uh, uh, well, let me just go back to the song of the Lamb because that's the easy one. The song, well, they're both easy, but the the more obvious one is the song that we see uh, given to us or that we hear about in the book of Revelation chapter 5. Remember, who's worthy to open the scroll? John cries when he realizes there's nobody worthy to open the scroll, understanding that the scroll is a title deed of the earth. And then the Messiah comes forth. Jesus is the one, the line of the tribe of Judah. He's the one that is worthy to open up the scroll. He breaks the seals on the scroll, and we know exactly uh, what happens as the story progresses, right? And then in that moment, there is a song that is being sung by the saints, and of course, that is the song of the Lamb, right? But then there's another song that they're singing, and this is what we call the Song of Moses. Now, again, this is where you have to know the Old Testament in, be, in order to be able to understand what you're looking at. So let me talk to you about the relevant portion of the Old Testament that you might not be familiar with that will help. It is about the book of Deuteronomy. Now, here's the problem with the book of Deuteronomy. It's not the problem with the book, but here's the problem with the way people look at the book, okay? One of the common assertions that I hear made regarding the book of Deuteronomy is the fact that the book of Deuteronomy is referred to as commonly the second law, okay? That is not correct. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, the reason why they call the book of Deuteronomy the second law is because Moses appears to be handing down to the people the law of God. And it is kind of different from the law that you heard handed down the first place, where it almost seems like it's a different set of laws, which is why they call it the second law, okay? But what's actually happening in Deuteronomy is Moses is about to die. Moses is a lot older and a lot wiser than he was when the law was first given to him. So Moses in Deuteronomy is giving the people of God his final words. He is telling them the words that he wants them to know. And what's really substantial about the book of Deuteronomy is it's not the second law, it is the reiteration of the law. In a way, 
that better encapsulates the spirit and the letter of it, if that makes any kind of sense. So when Moses is speaking in Deuteronomy, Moses is not only giving you the law, Moses is warning you of what happens when you rebel against it, and he's encouraging you of the, of the results of when you obey it. And he, and he also says all kinds of things that are encapsulated with the instruction that the law has provided. What he does is he actually comes to you, and he's telling me, and he's telling the children of Israel, he's saying, this is what you must do, you must obey the law of God, but he goes beyond that. And he says, here are the things that you gained from doing so. Here's the wisdom associated with it. In, in essence, it's an older, wiser man who's much better at what he does than when he was younger. Look, I've been teaching the Bible for almost 32 years, okay? And in doing so, I can tell you this right now, I'm a lot better at it today than I was when I first started, all right? A lot better. There's a lot of years of practice, a lot of years of study, and a lot of years of wisdom, right? And so you learn how to apply the things that you learn uh, way better, and you can communicate communicate better because you have a better uh, 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 understanding of the, of the passage. So Moses is reiterating in Deuteronomy the law. Now, why is that important? Because in Deuteronomy chapter 32, he teaches the people a song. And that is what people understand as being the song of Moses. Okay? Now, I would highly recommend that in your own time, you go over that passage and you learn the song and you understand the significance of the song. But what Moses is doing here is actually pretty brilliant. Moses designed the song to teach the people for the sake of the younger generation. Why? Because sometimes when you learn the words of a song, you learn the tune first. And as the years go by, you understand the significance of the song, right? And, and that's something that's, that's really interesting. When you take a moment to examine the words of the song, later as you get older, you begin to realize what the value of the song is and the significance of that song. By the way, it's interesting because we learn all kinds of songs when we were kids and when we get older, we realize those are probably not the best songs to be knowing, right? Um, Ring Around the Rosies and there's also, you, know, you learn some of the history of those songs and you're like, dude, they teach us songs about witchcraft when we were young, when we were young kids, right? You know, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. It's like, woo, my goodness. Like you don't understand. Like some of that is just founded in some real ugly uh, history, right? But Moses was wise. Moses was smart. Moses was like, I am going to teach them the law of God in a song that will cause them to remember the importance of applying it so that when they get older, they're going to understand it. Now, by the way, this also does something that can be very harmful. And that is when you learn certain facts using a song, you'll understand the song and you remember the song, but you sometimes won't understand the mechanics of the facts that are being communicated. I'll give you a great example of this. When I learned how to read Greek, my Greek teacher refused to teach us the Greek alphabet using a song. He said that it's harder, but if you learn to sing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Greek alphabet with a song, you will forget many of the significant variables involved in you being able to understand Greek words and vocabulary and reading certain phrases and understanding phrases. And I'm very glad that he did that with us because while other students were learning how to read Greek with a different teacher by uh, learning the song, I realized that with time, they dropped out and they lost their, their understanding of it. Um, and by the way, this is why we have such terrible literacy uh, levels here in the United States of America, some of the worst reading that we have is founded in some of the terrible educational mechanisms deployed to teach students how to read. Like, for example, it's not good to teach your kids A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Because what you do is you teach them to memorize something based on a song instead of emphasizing the uh, the the phonetical part of the alphabet instead of emphasizing uh, the heuristics behind how you actually read and understanding some of those things, it becomes very difficult. That's why Hooked on Phonics, although it was made fun of when I was a kid, people made fun of Hooked on Phonics all the time because Hooked on Phonics was a tool that you use when a kid couldn't read. And so if, if you were a kid when I was in school and uh, you said, I use Hooked on Phonics, you'd get made fun of um, because uh, it was considered to be a tool that was used for really uh, stupid kids. Well, the reality of it is it's actually the most brilliant tool or the, the mechanics behind it, the mindset behind the heuristical approach of Hooked on Phonics is actually the smartest tool available for teaching literacy um, in, in virtually any language, right? There are some exceptions to this, by the way. Um, when you start getting into some Asian languages, uh, some of the Cyrillic languages and Semitic languages, it, it, it might not work that way. It might not work on that level for a lot of reasons, and there's a whole lot to say about that. It, it, phonetics don't necessarily apply in the use of uh, Semitic languages, for example, or Asian languages. Like if you're learning Japanese or so on and so forth, it's a very different approach, right? But my whole point behind it is it was a very valuable tool because for me, it kept me from making the, the wrong mistakes. But when it's used to teach a foundational principle, it's a genius tool. And that's what Moses was doing in Deuteronomy 
chapter 32. Now, this is very important because what that illustrates to us is that God allowed the law of Moses to be carried into heaven in the last days. The Bible was being recited even with a song in the last days. How incredible is that? Imagine what Moses would have felt like had he known that his, the very words that he reiterated, the word of God that he reiterated would be sung in heaven. It's, it's pretty cool. Now look at the song that they sing because this is really important, right? And they, uh, uh, we, we talked about the song of Moses, right? Verse four, who shall not, well, let me, let me go to the end of the, of the song. Let me actually read verse three again because it's important. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, okay, let's, let's hear, this is what they talk about, right? Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thy King of saints. Okay, wouldn't it be amazing if we learned how to understand that? If we learned how to acknowledge God's works as great and mighty, how that would change the way we talk to him and how, how, how we approached him? If we understood the capability of God, how much more would it affect the way that we go to God when we ask him? right? Very powerful. And then look what he goes on to say, right? True are thy ways. If we understood how true God's ways were, then we would also pursue everything that he gives us. Why? Because the practical information that we can gain from the scriptures teach us everything we need to know about everything else. It's pretty powerful stuff. Look what I, look what I love here. I love this verse four. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou art holy, for all nations shall come and worship thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. I love this, right? Verse 4. Look at what it says, right? We learn this from this song. How important it is to do what? Number one, it's important to fear the Lord, right? We fear God. We fear God. And as we fear him, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to glorify his very name, right? It's pretty heavy when you think about the fact that we're told to glorify the name of God, even though he regards his word above his name. Pretty amazing, right? So when we fear God, we're going to glorify him. Why do we glorify him? We glorify him because he's holy, meaning he's different from anybody else. He's different from everything else. There is no God that is like our God, right? There is no God like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is no God like the God who gave us our salvation. And if we recognize that and know that, then we're going to treat him differently than everybody else, aren't we? Because he's different than everything else, and he's different from everybody else. And then notice it, all the nations shall come and worship before thee. This, you know what I learned when I, when I see this portion of the song? I realize, am I going to get with the program now and worship God? Or am I going to have the program forced on me when I bow before God with all the other nations and experience the judgment of God, right? Pretty powerful message that is, is here. Why? For thy judgments are made manifest. You remember when all the churches in, in, not all the churches, but a lot of the churches in America were beginning to march for George Floyd and, uh, and not march for the gospel and beginning to do all the things that they did, started falling into the woke industrial complex and all of that. It was because they forgot this last line. It was because they forgot that God's judgments are made manifest. Why? Because God, when God, first of all, God's judgments are real and true. But when God judges, God, or when God says he's going to judge, God is going to do it. When God actually says, this is what you need to do, and I promise you I will give you this, then he's going to do it. We forgot the fact that God's word is true. We forgot the fact that when God makes a promise, that promise is going to come true. And the thing is, is God told us not to fear death. And if he told us not to fear death, then it should have changed the way that we behave during that time. And the churches that didn't behave that way were churches that chose not to believe in the word of God, or at least they were led by men that chose not to believe in the word of God, right? We learn that from the song that they're singing here. They're recognizing this from heaven, that God uh, is a God who will do exactly what he says. By the way, this kind of reminds me of an aspect of parenting. Can I give you a good, a solid piece of parenting advice, everybody, right? Coming from a very experienced father who's been parenting for what? I don't know, four years, whatever. Okay, let me, let me just say this. Very, very important piece of parenting advice. Don't ever forget this, okay? Two things have to go in the discipline of your children. Assuming the fact that you're disciplining them, you have to discipline them, you have to, right? The discipline has to be consistent and the discipline has to be, and folks, believe me when I tell you this, the, the, the discipline has to be reliable. You know what I mean when I say that? Meaning your children have to know that you will never back down from the consequence you promised them for the behavior that, they, that they're given to. Now with that, let me just tell you so I can be very real with you and somewhat vulnerable. Lately, I've been feeling like all I'm doing is disciplining my children. <laughs> You know what I mean when I say that? It feels like I'm telling them no like 40, 50 times a day. They're getting consequences more times than you could. It's, very, it's a very discouraging and somewhat frustrating process. But I can tell you, it will always pay off in the end, right? It will always pay off in the end. Children, if you are here and you have parents that are disciplining you all the time and you don't like it and you think it's not fair and you think, man, mom and dad are so rough and they're so... Just listen to me when I tell you this. 
Your mom and dad love you. If they didn't love you, they'd let you get away with whatever you wanted to get away with. As a matter of fact, it's a function of them actually hating you if they did that. But because they love you, they're not gonna let you get away with anything. And let me tell you what happened as a result of a mom and dad that never let me get away with anything. Because my mom and dad never let me get away with anything, I'm here to minister to you, right? So God's judgments are what? They're made manifest. It's gonna happen. Verse five, and after that, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. By the way, one quick thing I'll stop on, and this is very, a very quick fact um, that we should all know if we're studying the Old Testament, and that is the fact that the, the tabernacle was specifically ordered by God to be built by his people. He made it very clear, you need to do it exactly as I say to the exact specs, exact everything, and he said only the best, only the most skilled people were to build it, and even the most skilled people were supernaturally empowered by God to do the building so that it would be done perfectly. You want to know why? Because the tabernacle was modeled after heaven. So if you were to be familiar with the tabernacle and then you went to heaven, it would look very much like the tabernacle that you were used to looking to. And that's why when people, uh, they hear, they look at this reference, and they go, oh, wow, there's a tabernacle in heaven. That means they're doing animal sacrifice. No, it doesn't mean anything of a sort. What it means is the tabernacle itself that we understood and read about in the book of Exodus and on is in essence the same tabernacle or modeled after the, the, the modeled after heaven right it, it's it's a picture into heaven for us and that's a very important fact to go over by okay so he's looking at heaven and look at this verse six and the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles verse seven and one of the four beasts gave unto uh the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled okay so we know something from the beginning of this passage we know from the beginning of the passage that these vials that are being talked about these plagues are represent the end of God's judgment right but then we learn something at the end of this passage and that's this no one gets to enter into the structure of the temple in heaven until God's judgment is finalized. Funny how that works. God's judgment and the execution of his judgment is necessary in order for the place of restoration to come in bringing things back to the way God intended for them to be brought. Now what that tells us is something significant as believers and that's this. There's no such thing as God letting people in the back door. There's no such thing as someone coming in by the hair of their chinny chin chin. God will do what he says he's going to do. And folks, I want to make myself clear. The most rewarding and powerful lives lived by people on this earth are the ones when they trust in God's word, even when it's not convenient to do so. Even when it feels like his word is not going to bring anything to the table, God always comes through on his word. So follow him, right? Believe him, trust him. Great things are coming. And here's the wonderful, most spectacular part of all that we've talked about. We're all going to be in heaven when this is happening, right? We're not going to see any of this. God is, God is reserving his judgment for the world that hates him. But for us, he's preventing us from experiencing it because he's going to take us beforehand. All the more reason why we should trust in God's word. All the more reason why we should study God's word. All the more reason why we should integrate the word of God in everything that we do, every part of our life. Amen? Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you for the amazing opportunity that we have to dig in, to learn what you have to say. Father, one thing is certain, that you are faithful, and you are good to us, Lord. Thank you for that faithfulness. Thank you for that goodness. Thank you for all that you show us, Lord. You are awesome, Lord. And Father, just go before us, fill us with your spirit, give us your mind, give us your heart, your understanding, your determination to do your will. We love you, God, and thank you. We look to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys, listen. The brothers are coming up. They're going to be available to pray for you. If you have any prayer requests, we certainly want to lift you guys up. And uh, we want to pray for you guys. One thing to note, and it is uh, important tonight, we are continuing on with our Christian Mindset series. And we are going to continue the discussion related to money. Uh, money is a small part of the discussion tonight. It's part of sort of the little mini series we're doing on the subject, but we're going to talk about God's view on wealth and, and what that actually looks like and what it means and uh, things that we as Christians should know because we are children of the King. But sometimes we have a very 
poor mindset that was not designed by God for us to have. And this is not a health and wealth message, right? It has nothing to do with that. But we sell ourselves short and we, we allow ourselves to be ripped off because we don't know how to apply God's word in the everyday practical life that we live. So very important stuff. We'll be doing that today, 5 p.m. So please make sure you're here. And then um, if you need to talk to me, I have to step away for just a little bit, uh, but I'll come out as soon as I'm done. Okay, love you guys. God bless you. Keep fighting the good fight.